Hey bro, which 360 camera settings do you use? This is a question I get all the time. So in today's video, I'm going to give an ultra extremely in-depth guide to how I set exposure with my 360 photos and my 360 videos and all the different considerations you should keep in mind when thinking about settings and exposure with your 360 photos and videos. And how good does my new background look? Turned out way better than I expected. Ooh, this is the ghost of Mr. Ben. Ah. And just like with this new shot with my DSLR, I deliberately chose the lighting, the camera settings to all turn into this specific lighting effect. And it doesn't matter if it's photo or video really, setting the exposure is something you'll have to consider with both of them. Yes, they do have slight nuances, but as you evolve beyond a complete beginner, this is something you're going to have to get your head around. So step one, let's start with photos, and that is never shoot in. JPEG. You know the JPEG that comes straight out of the camera? You turn the camera on, camera's like, hey bro, I'm ready to shoot. But no, you're not. You're in JPEG mode and that's bad. And the reason playing JPEG mode is bad is because the quality is at its lowest and you're capturing the least amount of information in the smallest file size possible. Which is okay for beginners, it's okay for happy snaps, but if you want a proper looking photo, most of the time JPEG is probably going to let you down. And for some 360 cameras, this is the only option. So I'm sorry about that. Although later on you'll see some settings that can actually help if this is your only option. Where JPEG is okay is when the camera has inbuilt HDR mode, which is a lot of 360 cameras these days, including the Insta 361R, some of the Theta cameras, and it does seem to be a common thing being added to 360 cameras these days. And as much as I don't want to give away my best kept secret, here it is. The vast majority of 360 photos I take are in inbuilt HDR mode. Yes, the photo technically does end up at JPEG, as do all 360 photos once you finish editing them, but with HDR, what it's doing is it's not just capturing one single JPEG photo, it captures three at three different exposures. Here is zero EV, which is the proper exposure for your location, then you have plus two EV, which means it's two stops of light overexposed, which means it's going to be a brighter shot. And then you have minus two EV, which is two stops of light under what the proper exposure should be. And the reason it captures those two is because it's covering the highlights and the shadows. So for the brighter shot that is two stops overexposed, what it's doing is exposing for the really dark areas of your image so those bits are properly exposed. Likewise, with the underexposed image, it makes everything really dark. However, the highlight areas, which are often overblown windows, turn into something you can actually look at. So you can see definition there in those highlights. And then what inbuilt HDR does is it takes the middle exposure, it takes the bright exposure, and it takes the dark exposure, whoop, blends them all together into one really well exposed image. Because contrast that's too high is the enemy of photographers. 360 photographers, DSLR photographers, all photographers. You don't want that contrast to be too high because that's when you start losing detail and you can really only recognize stuff in the properly exposed areas of that image. For example, this is underexposed, but that was a deliberate stylistic effect. But if this were a scene in 360, let's say I was making a virtual tour of this room, the exposure is terrible. So firstly, I'd have to play with the lighting a bit, and secondly, I'd have to work on that exposure and try inbuilt HDR. So I would say in the vast majority of situations, I use inbuilt HDR and it does a good job. Most 360 cameras have a default of two stops inbuilt HDR, but with cameras like the 1R, you can set it to four stops, which means with these three photos, instead of there being a two stop difference, there's a four stop difference, meaning this really bright shot, it could turn pitch black behind me into a properly exposed image. Then on this side, it could turn a really extremely bright highlight into a proper exposure. I mean, every scene is different, obviously it has a different level of contrast, but yeah, you get the idea. Another downside sometimes is if you've taken a four stop HDR photo and you've got someone's face in it, suddenly because HDR basically lowers the contrast in the scene, you start losing features from your face. So it can be an unflattering mode when used to the extreme with people in it. Shooting with inbuilt HDR is usually done in auto exposure mode, which means you don't need to consider any camera settings at all, other than just changing it literally in the app from regular photo 
photo to HDR photo, which is really handy because you don't always want to be thinking about, oh, what should the shutter speed be in this situation? Maybe I should change the ISO. No, you don't want to do that all the time. In certain situations, yes, but not all. Next, we will move into some slightly more advanced territory. <laughs> and that's shooting manually and probably shooting in RAW. So let's say you've tried inbuilt HDR in a scene and it still doesn't quite look right. You've still got really bright highlights or you've still got really dark shadows and you're not satisfied with the exposure or maybe it turned out really noisy or there are color blotches, you know, the blotchy colors that stick together and don't look very nice. There are all kinds of imperfections 360 photos can have, which is why sometimes you've got to take it into your own hands. Now, the first setting you'd consider when setting your exposure manually is the white balance. This is essentially how warm or cool or purple or green an image can be. Sometimes the light in a location is really bad and the camera misinterprets the quality of the light and it might make your photos a bit too purple or a bit too blue. This is when you could manually change the white balance to something else to mitigate that a bit. But to be perfectly honest with you, 99.9% .9 of the time, I don't touch the white balance. It's usually really easy to change it later and I just can't be bothered doing it while I'm shooting. Especially when you're shooting in RAW, you have the ability to fix problems later that a JPEG couldn't give you. So if you've got the white balance off, you can bring it back to what it should be and it's not turning, let's say, an orange photo into an orange photo that has been turned blue, which is what would happen with the JPEG, whereas the exact same scene shot in RAW, you could turn the orange into a more neutral color. Now, let's say you've got a challenging lighting situation like I have here in my studio and you need to set your exposure manually to get it properly exposed. Here's what I do. The first place that I always go is to the ISO and I make that bad boy as low as I possibly can. That's normally around ISO 100. A high ISO is bad news and it makes your photos really grainy. So the main setting I adjust regardless of the 360 camera I'm using is the shutter speed because different shutter speed settings can affect the light greatly and you can turn a pitch black room into a properly lit room. Likewise, you can turn an extremely bright location into a dark one by setting the shutter speed. And the shutter speed refers to how long the camera actually takes the photo. So if it's a fast shutter speed, it'll go like this. If it's a slow one, it will go like this. And for slower shutter speeds, you just need to be careful not to have any movement at all because that will cause blurriness with your shot and ghosting if there's people walking around your shots. And ghosting is essentially like there's a ghost. Like the ghost of Mr. Ben. This brings me to shooting at night where a long exposure is usually going to be the thing to do. But before I go for the long exposure, just like before during daylight, I'm going to go to inbuilt HDR first to see what that can do. A lot of the time it gets it right at nighttime because it's taking those three photos. It's not only accounting for the darker areas in the image, but for the highlights, let's say you've got street lights in your scene that are really bright, it brings those right down so they don't completely overexpose and ruin your image. Then you just gotta make a call. Did it do a good enough job? If not, that's when you go into manual mode and set your shutter speed to a longer one, like one, two, or even up to 10 seconds sometimes. Some cameras like the 1R also have night mode, which is essentially optimized for nighttime shooting to try and minimize noise at nighttime. Because the darker your scene, the more noise is likely to show up. The live preview in your camera's app will always be a guide as to how well or badly you've exposed your image. So check that because it'll give you live feedback. And you can normally tell with your own eye whether it looks right or not, you can make your changes, then take the shot. One thing I really like about the 1R is it has a histogram you can access as you're shooting. So when you open up the app, you can see live feedback from your scene and it essentially shows you if your shot is over or underexposed. And this works in exactly the same way as we know histograms with DSLRs and traditional photography. By the way, I'd also add that daylight scenes, let's say the sun is shining bright and you can see everything very clearly, those are always the easiest 
easiest to expose, so you won't have much difficulty at all shooting an inbuilt HDR or single shot RAW or even JPEG, if that's all your camera has, it's probably going to do a really good job in bright sunlight. So we've covered daytime, we've covered nighttime. What about really, really difficult situations where the contrast is so high and inbuilt HDR isn't cutting it? Shooting single shot RAW still isn't cutting it even after you've got the exposure right, you've edited the photo, but you're still getting overblown highlights or crushed shadows. This is where I'd use bracketing, which is essentially manually shooting in HDR where you'd use beyond three shots. So you go up to five, seven, nine, or even more if you wanted. And you're basically exposing for every quality of light in your room. I do have a tutorial about this on my channel, so do check it out. It's called How to Get the Perfect Exposure for Interiors, or something like that. Because virtual tours are often the hardest scenes to expose because you've always got that inconsistent light and it's just something you're going to have to learn. Because when you're shooting for clients, it's costly to make mistakes and to be learning on the job. So you need to understand these methods inside and out. And by the way, I go into my 360 photo workflows in way more depth inside my video course, Virtual Tour Pro, and it covers every kind of situation imaginable for shooting 360 photos professionally. So if that's you, if that's something you plan on doing, I would definitely suggest checking it out. I'll put a link to it down there. Okay, so that's it for photos. The main lesson being always shoot in inbuilt HDR if you can and if it looks good. So now let's quickly go over video because there are different considerations you'll have to make when shooting video. So whenever I'm shooting 360 video, regardless of the camera, the first thing I always do is set the resolution to be as high as possible. 360 video isn't super sharp when you watch it back in 360, so you need every last pixel you can get. Even if you only intend on displaying it at a lower resolution later, if you plan on reframing it or doing something else, it's always always best to give yourself the most amount of pixels possible to work with so you can always downscale from there but you can't upscale from a lower quality video. So for this one it's going to be 5.7k and here's another embarrassing thing that I'm embarrassed to admit but the vast majority of time when I'm shooting 360 video I just do it in auto mode because cameras are smart they know how to expose video and very rarely have I shot a 360 video where the exposure was completely messed up, where it was too grainy, or it chose the wrong settings that ruined the video. Especially during daylight scenes, it's likely to get it right and you just don't need to overcomplicate the process. Interestingly, the One R also has HDR video, which is an extremely rare thing to see from a 360 camera. And to be honest, I've gotten mixed results from it. I probably wouldn't rely on it, but it's something you can always play with if you own a camera like this. Now, of course, you can set your exposure manually too with video. Let's say you want slow motion. You're gonna have to change the resolution. You're gonna have to change the frames per second. And with basically all cameras, the slower the slow motion gets, the lower the quality also is. With One R, it's 100 frames per second at 3K. And for me, 3K is just too low resolution for it to be a worthwhile thing. I think at the bare minimum right now, 4K 360 video is the lowest amount of quality you can get away with because there are always those people that say, that 360 video looks like garbage. Woo. Anyway, those people are always gonna be around, so you can't always please them, but it is good to try and keep your resolution as high as possible with all work you post. So where I think the sweet spot for slow motion is, is around 4K 50 frames per second, because you can always slow that down a bit more later. You could probably go up to about 100 frames a second. Yeah, it might look a tiny bit jittery, but at least you've got that 4K resolution, so it's going to be sharper slow motion and make the overall clip more worthwhile. And of course, all 360 cameras have different specs in terms of slow motion, so use that roughly as a guide. Now, there's only a certain amount of settings you can change when setting your exposure manually with 360 video. The main reason is the frame rate. Anything other than 24, 25, 50, 60, and everything in between, anything other than that is going to look funny. If the shutter speed was slower, the video would turn into this. And if it was faster than about 60 frames per second, suddenly it's going to be like, like an action movie. And both result in a pretty unnatural feel. So always be careful with that shutter speed. In different countries, there's different frame rates. So use whichever one you feel most comfortable with. But for me, for the average 360 video, I'd shoot at 30 frames per second. The 
final setting I would consider, and yes, this only applies to the One R, is night mode. It has an option on the display for low light stability. And essentially what this does is it changes the internal settings so you don't get motion blur at night time. Because most cameras by default want to slow down the shutter speed at night time because it's dark and it needs to do that to see. But unfortunately, a result of that is motion blur. So this setting changes other things in the camera that essentially remove the motion blur. And yeah, I think that's it. I can't think of any other settings I would use. Can you think of any? Or do you have anything else to add? If so, let me know down there. And that's it for this video with my brand new backdrop. Looks so cool, so happy with it. Hit the like button if you like this video. Hit the dislike button if you didn't. And bye.